Okay, how we doing? Pretty good? Ready to start uh, leave the world of the time domain transmission lines behind and start doing some sinusoidal stuff. This is the world that, that I lived in for the longest time. Uh, when I was a, a student, we didn't even learn time domain transmission line stuff because it was really radio frequency engineers that really had to care about time uh, about transmission line effects. Digital world, you know, 20 years ago was really far behind. We didn't care about transit times. The circuits were too slow. I was, I was the biggest. I felt like the uh, the bomb when I entered into Virginia Tech and I got the standard requisite required um, computer system back in 1992. They had to get. Uh, they made all their students buy top of the line 386s. 16 megahertz processors. It was a revolutionary. You're never going to need transmission line uh, effects on a motherboard that clocks that slow, probably. So uh, instead, when I took EMAG, we started with this stuff, at least when we got to the transmission line unit. Because the RF engineers had had to worry about that for years and years and years, almost as soon as they started the business, back when Marconi made his transmitter and receiver. Why? Because you're operating in the, the tens, hundreds of megahertz or higher in microwave frequencies, three gigahertz or higher. There the wavelength gets so small and your cabling, I mean almost any, any cable in RF is electromagnetically significant and you have to worry about transmission line effects. Uh, the difference is, of course, that everything is modulated onto a carrier when you're dealing with RF for communications. Uh, purposes. So in that case, the signals look a lot different. They're not pulses. They're a bunch of sine waves that have been going on for quite a long while. In fact, they're usually sine waves with stuff modulated onto them. You, put, you change their amplitude and or you change the phase or the frequency slightly to put your information on. However, we're going to analyze pure sinusoids because it turns out if the information is slow enough, the analysis that you do for uh, perfect sinusoid is valid for a slightly changing sinusoid whose frequency is modulating or phase is modulating or amplitude is slowly modulating. Uh, so that's, that's why um, what we do in the next couple lectures is going to be valid to just about any type of uh, sinusoidal carrier, even if there's a communication signal on it. Um, if you're in the power industry, how many people are planning to go into power? major in some of those things. Good, good. We will always need power. You, those are the four people that will always have jobs. So make sure you get their names and their phone numbers so that you can borrow money from them. When you're unemployed, when your startup makes a million dollars, gives you a big bonus and then cuts you off. So, so good. So the first thing we need to talk about we're going to do a brief review of the phaser transform because we need that. And my experience is that you've seen it once or twice in your classes, but sometimes it takes three times before something sets in. We need to understand what the phaser transform is and why we care about it. So, when you were in high school trigonometry, you studied sine waves for the first time, and hopefully your trig teacher wrote the generic form on the board for a sine wave. Sine wave, you need three pieces of information to track the behavior of a sine wave. You've got the amplitude, the frequency, and the phase. And in your DC analysis of circuits, you only needed one piece of information to track in the system, right? DC voltage, DC current. If everything had shaken out for a while, 
And there was only one physical quantity you needed to specify to get the voltage of the current anywhere in a network. But if this is your input, if it's a sine wave, well, notice a couple things. First of all, this thing has been going on since t equals to minus infinity. There are no transients. Everything is assumed to have steady, uh, settled down into a steady state. So the voltage, if we have a voltage or a current described by this quantity, everything's been going on from t equals to minus infinity, and it's assumed that nothing's going to change and it's going to keep doing what it's doing until plus infinity, t equals plus infinity. Now, many of the systems that we study, with the exception of the thing that you're looking at on your homework, homework number four, many of the systems we study in the physical sciences and in electrical engineering have two extremely important qualities about them. They are linear and time invariant. In fact, this happens so much if you're really cool, you just abbreviate this as LTI. Oh yeah, I got an LTI system I'm solving. It's linear time invariant sum up the inputs, just the same summing up the outputs. Time invariant, if I operated something on the system, I put an input in there at t equals to minus infinity, plus infinity, infinity, four seconds, three seconds. It doesn't matter when, it's always going to give you the same exact output. Nothing changes. So linear time invariant systems have very, some, one really important property uh, when it comes to frequency content. That is, they can never excite on their outputs frequency content that didn't come in on their inputs. It can change the amplitudes of sinusoids, it can change the phases of sinusoids, but the LTI systems will never be able to change the frequency. And that's the important part. So really, the idea behind the phasor transform is that there are three things we need to track in a sinusoidal excitation and output. But really, there's only two things, because this thing's never going to change. So now I'm gonna, just going to track two values in my, my system, which is still twice as many as my DC circuit. So this is why I need to introduce complex numbers. Because complex numbers always have two pieces of information, a real or imaginary, or an amplitude and a phase, depending on which, how you want to work it. So. In electrical engineering, this is how we have chosen to do it. The phasor X, and a lot of times on the board I'll put a capital X, and just to denote it's a phasor, I will often put a squiggle. That's a really old time notation, but you know, I have trouble doing some of the things that your books and your notes doing on the, uh, do on the board, like, like bold. Bold is hard to do. So for example, when we get it to vectors, you know, like the, the A vector is really like... <laughs> And I, I don't want to spend, waste time drawing that. If, if A is a vector, just put a little vector on top of it. So, I don't think, I don't, I don't understand how like, that notation grew up in the age of blackboard uh, presentations. It's like somebody forgot that you couldn't bold on the board. So anyway, when I have a phaser, some people like to do bold, some people just capitalize. I like capitalize, but you know, some of these variables, they look the same if you capitalize them. I put a squiggle, and that means a phaser. And the phaser transform for x is very simple. You take the amplitude, you put it there, and you take the phase, and you write E, X, B, J phase. And that's your phaser. That's your phaser in polar form. We say polar form because if we plotted this on a real and imaginary two-dimensional graph, your A would be the length. Let me write that a little clearer. A is the length from the origin to there. And then my phi is the angle that that makes. I could just as easily express this in Cartesian form where x is the projection of this point onto the real value line and y is the projection onto the imaginary line. I can calculate that using Euler's law, where, which allows me to write complex exponents 
as simply cosine of phi plus j sine of phi. And this is my y, and this is my x. Why do I sometimes like phasers in polar form and sometimes I like them in Cartesian form? Why would you do one versus the other? That's right. Excellent. Do you hear what he said? Cartesian form is good for adding and subtracting quantities. So if you're doing something like a KVL or a KCL, take all your things and put them into Cartesian because you're adding stuff up. When you're doing multiplication, you should use the polar form because that's much easier to multiply or divide. You know, if you've got Ohm's law and you've got an impedance, complex impedance and a complex current and you're trying to find a complex voltage, get those suckers in the polar form because you're not going to you're going to be wasting a lot of time if you leave them in the Cartesian form, even though you can do that first times outer, inner, crap. When you report a phaser, it is usually best to do in the polar form. In fact, it's usually best to do in the form where you say x is equal to amplitude and phase and when you're reporting a final value, it's often good to put that in degrees. Because the natural unit, when you do all your computations, leave it in radians. But when you finally, when you present that report to your supervisor or your manager, um, we technical people have enough trouble t you know, thinking about like 2.789 radians. Your, your manager is going to have a terrible time with that. He'll understand degrees. She'll understand degrees. She'll figure that out. So, so do, do your higher-ups a favor. Give, give them values in degrees. But don't compute with them. Now, es, in the, the esoteric sense here, um, always re recognize that that complex value that is a phaser is, is not something you can ever, ever measure on a scope. There's no, there's no j-axis on a scope, right? I mean, you can artificially put to someone with it, but there's no such thing as 5 plus j7 current. If you ever want to take a phaser, regardless of how complex the expression may be, if you ever want to take a phaser back into the time domain, just remember this one simple conversion. x of t is equal to the real value x with a squiggle exp plus j 2 pi ft so this is how we get our frequency back in this is the frequency that we were taking for granted we just put that in a complex exponential multiply it by our phasor take the real value you can do that for any complex value and then what you get is something that's a function of time that you can literally measure with scope probes let's just calculate this out just to verify that this is true we said that my phaser for that one was e, uh, a times exp j phi well when I have two expo complex exponents multiplying one another I can really just add their arguments so let me add plus 2 pi ft and I take the real value of this whole thing. I got a real value amplitude, so I can take that out in front. And the real value of my Euler's law expansion of this complex exponential is cosine 2 pi ft plus phi plus j sine 2 pi ft plus phi. This is the real part. This is the imaginary part. The imaginary part goes away, and what I'm left with is my original time domain expression. It seems rather trivial now, but when we get into electromagnetic waves and you've got field quantities to deal with, we use the exact same definition. We actually put a vector here, and you can reconstitute the time domain uh, as, uh, original time domain expression. Or, as we're going to see when we talk about voltages and currents on transmission line, remember 
V and I were functions of space and time simultaneously, which means that by converting them into the phasor domain for a time harmonic system, we got rid of the time dependence. We can just track phasors as a function of space. But that function of space is always there, and to reconstitute the full space-time waveform, my traveling waveforms, I gotta put them back into this same expression. Yeah, did you have a question? Yeah. Did you intentionally remove the phase? Uh, oh, no, no. I intentionally, I accidentally forgot it. Oh, that is a close one. Any questions? Pretty simple stuff, right?